I think if we were under the state, we would definitely have a different outcome here um, because they were really politically driven. Um, here we're, we weren't driven by politics to, to build our policies. Our main focus was our protect our community. Welcome to another episode of Everywhere Extra. My name is Jan Pitalski and I'm the associate editor with The Daily Under. In this episode, we visit the Walker River Paiute tribe in Shurs, Nevada, and tell the story of how tribal sovereignty allowed them to fight COVID-19 successfully. Pija Tabino, me, Amber Torres, me, Nania, ne, agai de karapoinabi, ne, agai gwe. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amber Torres. I'm the chairman for the Walker River Paiute Tribe here in Shores, Nevada. When we very first learned of the pandemic and what its capabilities were, we um, put a lot of safety requirements in place. We immediately shut down, um, game planned, and then laid those instructions out to our constituents and our tribal membership and our community. Um, you know, there was a lot of fear as to, do we know what we're doing? How are we going to face it? How are we going to do it together? And how are we going to keep our people safe? Everything started shutting down. And then it was into, where do we move next? How do we move next? Because services can't stop. But it's like, how, how do we safely go about it? My name is Tarita Cordova and I'm the office manager for the COVID program for the Walk River Tribal Health Clinic. We provide educational materials to them as well as to how to handle when you have a, say, a household member um, who has tested positive for COVID, um, to how they, they have to isolate, but, you know, to keep them in the other rooms. And then that's why we provide educational materials and they provide a handout. The tribe basically use their CARES funding to go out and purchase a lot of the PPEs and a lot of the stuff on our own so we could provide that because we weren't really getting any assistance at that time from the state or the feds yet. It was like, it's coming. We're still waiting. Um, it's coming down the line, but it's like it's not here. And so we had to go on our own, find different vendors, find different people to purchase our PPEs from and then have them delivered sometimes on the weekend, sometimes late at night. We never stopped services here. We continued to deliver healthcare, um, you know, social services, elder program, um, you know, which was making sure that they got fed every single day. Across Indian country, that was everybody's major um, objective, was to take care of their elders and make sure that they were safe and that they had everything that they needed, you know, within their own comfort of their home. But um, because they are our historians, you know, they are our culture, our language, um, our teachers. It's an ongoing war within a, every child, tribal community of a, a foot race of trying to preserve and record our elders before they pass on. Currently I am the language teacher for the Yarrington High School, the Intermediate and the Shurs Elementary School. So my role here for the community is to just preserve our NUMA culture uh, best ways we can. Our traditional name is the Gaidekara, which is the trout eaters. Our reservation boundaries was established in 1873, I believe. Chiefs and our leaders, you know, created this boundary for us of where we used to live. A lot of the, our ancient culture and our traditions weren't practiced enough. Agricultural, practices, Christianity, a lot of that stuff was put into our people's minds and how they used, how they needed to live. Our livelihoods were taken from us. Kids were taken to residential schools to erase what they had in them, their culture, their traditions, their language. A lot of Native students never had the opportunity to learn about their culture uh, at their homes or maybe in their, in their own communities. So that's kind of what my role is, is just to introduce themselves back to who we were as NUMA people. And during the pandemic of it all, you know, we lost a lot of good fluent speakers. 
cultural people, traditional people, people who ran our ceremonies for us. You know, these guys have taken that journey due to COVID. We went through the whole thing. You know, it was boring at first, you know how it is. But most of the people here followed all the rules that were set by the, the council. You know, like the masks, the six feet apart, and where you're going, this and that. No big parties anywhere in like a funeral or whatever, you know, basketball games. Later, it, it seized, it went down and down. And Amber's pretty cautious. We were probably the last to really open up like we are now. Early on, we really promoted mental health wellness, you know, because people had to be quarantined, um, you know, and we really set strict policies here for if you were exposed at work, you went home, you went home with your whole family. We figured out how we were going to keep this community safe by shutting our borders down. Um, it got so intense that we even shut out our tribal members that didn't live on our reservation because we needed to keep our people safe. You know, I come from a family of uh, two sisters and three other brothers. And all of them except for me were living outside of the reservation. So they felt like it was very tough to not be able to come visit, especially when you're stressed about the health of your parents. You know, they, they didn't know what was really going on and all they could do is talk to them or video call. Um, but then the tribe also provided like, um, like uh, laptops and ta uh, tablets and stuff for people to be able to talk to their families outside of, outside of the reservation. Um, and I think that was really, really important and like vital in keeping our numbers low. It turned into a political thing instead of a health thing. Um, we started getting, you know, you get bashed by people because you're wearing your face mask or because you're trying to protect your people by in, in vaccinations. It was an uphill battle. In March 17th is when the tribe closed. Um, and then around end of March, April is when the idea came about to how do we get food to our community? Because we were, we were noticing going to Fallon, which is 50 miles away, Yarrington is about 30, 25 minutes, Hawthorne's about 50 still. 45, 50, um, you'd go to the grocery stores and the shelves were empty. It was just really striking to see how, how people from major cities were coming out to rural areas and really stripping the, the one source of groceries that we have. So with all these extra people coming in and, you know, packing up for building a U-Haul, you know, it was just striking. And it made, I think it, it made a lot of people afraid for our own um, food supplies because that's it for us. So me and Victim Services Coordinator Fawn, um, we came with the idea, we pitched it to Amber and said, hey, could we try to build a community store to put staple items? And we contacted Bonanza and Reno and produce and because they couldn't get the produce out fast enough, they were willing to open up to anybody who wanted to buy. We got a list from our health clinic of this, um, our elders and our disabled and then we would go and deliver to their homes. And so they had fresh vegetables, cheese, staple items, some meats, um, you know, like chicken or hamburger. Um, and we would do that every week. When we first started, Fawn and Bill were picking up the food. They would go over, because we go over and pick up the food once a week and we come over here, we put it away, and then we get it ready to give to the community. Well, we were just coming over, helping unload, the food and and at that time it was like <laughs> you walked in and there was mountains of boxes we didn't know what was in the boxes or and there were mountains of vegetables and we didn't exactly know what we were doing we just knew that um we had to get it out while it's still good and then in um november of um what 19 or 20 we we, we had to go start picking up at the food bank directly for food boxes I met the guy, Chris Gleam, and he, you know, he's like, hey, you're from Shurs. I said, yeah. And he's like, hey, have you guys thought about ever doing a food pantry? And I said, what's a food pantry?
Winners is our food pantry. It's our new uh, community-based program that we do to provide food security to our community. Hi, how are you today? See you Thursday. So every Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 4, the community will come down here and then when they come through, we scan them into our OASIS system through Nevada Food Bank. Let me show you guys inside what it looks like. Um, it's got two different things happening in there. You got our tribal side of our PPE for all of our, uh, our storage facility for the tribe and then our little area for the food pantry. That's today's menu based off what they got. And then so Thursday, they're gonna, they'll come back and create another menu for Thursday of what they're handing out for that. So at least they get a hot, a hot dinner and we get the snacks and the drinks. And then we also work with the school and our tutoring program and we hand this stuff off to them too. So it, it still goes back around to our community, to our kids too. Oh, the food bank is the best place in the world. It helps us out so much. It does what it's supposed to be doing. Thank you. The food pantry is definitely a, a huge food security for the tribe and our community. And um, I want to say when I pulled numbers last time, it was about uh, 355 households, um, which is they consider non-duplicate. Um, but, and it's about 6,500 bags of food we put out last year. Um, it's a lot. Um, food Bank came down and did, they, do our, they do quarterly audits on us. And they said that we are the biggest food pantry pushing out as much food as we did from a food pantry um, in the state. We were able to put aside some CARES funding for a food sovereignty project, which means getting back into our old traditional ways of growing our own, feeding our own, and making sure that, you know, should we ever come upon a natural disaster again, that we will have food on our reservation and that no, none of our members would go hungry. I actually developed, a, I called it the fruit tree program, the community fruit tree program, because there are uh, probably more than 50, 60, 70 trees, fruit trees that are established on the reservation currently. The big goal is to up our food production so that we aren't re so reliant on outside sources of food. Temperature is normal. We shared a lot of our best practices, um, not only on, you know, what we were doing to protect our people and our reservations um, by building programs and also with the funding that had come down from the federal government as to how we were spending it, um, you know, based on requirements and you know, that I can definitely say that that helped out a lot of different um, tribes and, you know, Indian country just shared best practices overall. Our biggest thing right now is, is the edu education, um, wellness, health, um, physicals, um, you know, coming in and understanding why it's important to have your vaccinations, why it's important to have your um, you know, your yearly physicals. We've had about 380 people uh, totally vaccinated on the reservation. Um, that's about half of our population. Um, and of those, we've had, we have um, about 250 who have been received their boosters. So um, th those are going well. We have uh, vaccination clinics um, twice a month and we try to separate them. Um, we, ha we do still have youth that are coming in for their vaccinations and we do have adults that are coming in for first and seconds, but a lot of them are boosters for right now. It, it, it worked, <laughs> you know, and without that, having that tribal sovereignty and going and building extra on top of extra, you know, and adding extra services and, and those services went back to the community and protected those homes. Tribal sovereignty is one of the most important issues that we continue to advocate for and that hoping that people respect that tribal sovereignty and that the decisions that we make here are put in place for the best behalf of our community. I really do think that that's why we were able to keep our numbers down, we were able to keep our people safe, and we're able to go back to what is considered the new normal now. I really hope to see our people come together again as before uh, the 
rise of colonization here on this land. I really want our people to focus on who we are again, you know, continuing on our, our ceremonies and traditions. So um, I'm just really enjoying the time that I have doing these things for the next generation. When we look at the final outcome and that we, a majority of our reservation is all still here to come together once again, although still continuing to mourn and, um, you know, feel the impacts and the loss of the ones that we did lose. You know, I just want to say that, you know, I'm thankful for, you know, um, our ancestors before for, again, putting that fight inside of us to continue, not give up and continue that resiliency because, again, we're paving the way for the next seven generations and making sure that, you know, that is carried on and that everything that we do is still practiced and continued in the future. So, you know, that's, I'm very happy about that.